watching a Coast Media presentation. Yeah, so I'm so um, amazed at what God is doing. I'm going to talk about why I worship. And I felt like everything is so worship this morning. Communion, the worship was all about Jesus. It's just beautiful. And, and everything I'm going to share, I want you to see it as is, is yours. Because Jesus is not just mine. Jesus is all of us. He's our beloved, our Savior, our Lord. All of us. Everything that he's done for me, I know he wants for you. And it's available for you, as is for me. Amen? So we're going to start... Um, I don't have my Bible, sorry, but it's all the Passion Translation. So if you want to follow me, it's going to be on the screen, and you can also go to Bible Gateway, and the Passion Translation is there, the whole translation that is already. So I think I'm going to, with this uh, translation, because it's so extravagant. <laughs> and I like extravagant. <laughs> <laughs> Luke 7, 36. You know the title of that? Extravagant worship. Yeah. So, Jesus is extravagant with us. Yeah. And that's why I love to be extravagant with him. Amen? So, uh, Luke 7, 36. Afterward, a Jewish religi religious leader named Simon asked Jesus to his home for dinner. Jesus accepted the invitation. When he went to Simon's home, he took his place at the table. In the neighborhood, there was an immoral woman of the streets, knowing to all to be a prostitute. When she heard about Jesus being in Simon's house, she took an exquisite flask made from alabaster, filled it with the most expensive perfume, went right into the home of the Jewish religious leader, and knelt at the feet of Jesus in front of all the guests. Broken and weeping, she covered his feet with the tears that fell from her face. She kept crying and drying his feet with her long hair. Over and, over and over, she kissed Jesus' feet. Then she opened her flask and anointed his feet with her costly perfume as an act of worship. When Simon saw what was happening, he thought, this man can be a true prophet. If he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of sinful woman is touching him. Let's pray for a second. Jesus, we give you permission this morning to go deep into our hearts. We open up our hearts to you. We want to know you as you are. We want to see you as you are. We want to see your eyes with flames of fire for the passion and desire that you have for us. Let me be a burning bush whom through you speak this morning, Lord. Let me be a sign that points to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. So this scripture is very dear to me. When I became a Christian, I was a bartender. You guys knew that? <laughs> I am still, yes, but another kind of wine. <laughs> So I was a bartender, I've I been a model, I've been all over the place, you know. And uh, when, I, when uh, I came to Jesus, my friend became, a, my best friend became a Christian first, and she would tell me, please come to church, because I was depressed all the time, I was sad all the time, nothing, I, like I can have anything, I can do anything, as I thought, I thought I can do anything, but nothing fulfilled me, nothing will give me the, the peace or the joy Nothing. And um, my friend will tell me over and over and over, just come to, to church. You need Jesus. You need Jesus, love. And so I say, well, you don't bother me. I'm going to go. But then you stop. Let, leave me alone. So I went to church. And, oh, my God, the worship was on, you guys. And I was, I never knew that. I never been in a Christian church before. I never I never felt the love of God. I never experienced the presence of God. And I was in worship, and I, I 
didn't know what to do, but I couldn't stop weeping and crying as the love of God just came and overwhelmed me completely. It was like what I was looking for, I finally found. What I so needed in my soul, what my soul was so longing for, finally I found him. It was not something, it was the person of Jesus Christ that I needed. They came and overflow and overtook my heart and my soul with such passion and desire that I became his in that very moment. Nobody prayed for me. Nobody came and told me, you need to be safe. I gave my heart and my life right there to Jesus because he was the one I needed. He was the one I longed for. He was the one that my soul was longing and seeking for in these other places that he was not at. So I became completely undone in the love, liquid love of Jesus that I not even knew was love. Oh, Jesus. But I say, whoever you are, I am yours, fully yours, forever yours. Uh, you are all that I want. And after that, I could not get out of church. You cannot get me out. <laughs> I became addicted to the presence of God, to the love of Jesus. Holy Spirit and I just like best friends forever, you know. I cannot get away from him at all. I will spend hours and hours in the Word. You know, you think that it's the people that are of the Holy Spirit, they don't know the Word. Believe me, I spend seven hours a day in the Word. And like visions in front of me of the Word of God. Becoming alive in front of me. The word of God is not boring. You're boring. We're boring. <laughs> you know, he's not boring at all. You know, when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, when Jesus comes and opens his word, his love letters to you, there's nothing boring about that. It's so amazing. So when I came to Jesus, obviously I felt like the worthless thing in the world, right? I was like, I was sinning. Like I became to discover everything I was doing was a sin. And we come to him and we think we're so worthless, we're so sinful, we are um, not worthy of anything. But what does Jesus do? That very moment when I came, I haven't even asked for forgiveness and he made me feel like I was the last beautiful thing on the planet. As soon as I came to him, he, he embraced me and loved me like no one else had loved me before. Before I even repented, it was his love that drew me in. It was his love that made me pure. It was his love that transformed me. And it has been like with all of us. You didn't come just because he drew you in. He drew every one of us in. He gave all of what he is because you're so worthy to him. Maybe you don't see yourself worthy, but to him you're so worthy to give it all, to give his life, to give his blood, to leave his kingdom, his deity, his glory just to have you. That's how worthy you are to Jesus. That's who you are to him. That's who we are. And I, I wrote a song about this scripture, and it says, it, I wrote it in, in Spanish, but I'm going to translate it for you, kind of. <laughs> so it says, I wrote the song, and it says in English, it says, you saw me in the midst of 10,000. You saw me in my sin. With eternal love, you seen me in your hands. And today, I want to adore you. I want to wash your feet with my tears of love. I want to dry them with my hair. Today I want to bow, bow, bow low, surrender before you in adoration and communion with you. I want to be. I want to live only for you. So now that you know what it says, I'm going to sing it to you in Spanish. Okay? You saw me, me viste entre diez mil, me viste en mi pecado, me viste con amor eterno, me viste en tus manos. 
Y hoy quiero adorarte Hoy quiero lavar tus pies Con mis lágrimas de amor Y enjugarlos con mis cabellos Hoy quiero rendirme Rendida ante ti En adoración y comunión contigo Quiero estar, yo quiero vivir Tan solo para ti Un alabastro de amor Un alabastro de amor The chorus says, an alabaster of love, pouring all before you. An alabaster of love, I want to be pouring onto you, Jesus. That's what it says. So let's see what the scripture says on um, 739. When Simon saw what was happening, he thought, this man can be a true prophet. If he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of sinful woman is touching him. Jesus said, Simon, I, I have a word for you. Go ahead, teacher. I want to hear it, he answered. It is a story about two men who were deeply in debt. One owed the bank $100,000, and the other only owed $10,000. When it was obvious that neither of them would be able to repay their debts, the kind banker graciously wrote off the debts and forgave them all they owed. Tell me, Simon, which of the two debtors will be the most tempful? Which one will love the banker the most? Simon answered, I suppose it will be the one with the greatest debt forgiven. You are right, Jesus agreed. Then he spoke to Simon about the woman still weeping at his feet. Don't you see this woman kneeling here? She's doing for me what you didn't, didn't bother to do. When I entered your home as your guest, you didn't think about offering me water to watch the dust of my feet. Yet she's, she came into your home and watched my feet with her many tears and then dried my feet with her hair. You didn't even welcome me into your home with the customary kiss of greeting. But from the moment I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't take the time to anoint my head with fragrant oil, but she anointed my head and feet with the finest perfume. She has been forgiven of all of her many sins. This is why she has shown me such extravagant love. But those who assume they have very little to be forgiven will love me very little. Then Jesus said to the woman at his feet, all your sins are forgiven. All the dinner guests said among themselves, who is the one who can even forgive sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith in me has given you life. Now you might live and walk in the ways of peace. And that's what happened to me. I don't know what happened to you, but that's what happened to me. When I was worthless, he made me worthy. He made me his. He made me his. And he has made you his. You are his. So Jesus transforms us with his love. I came to him a sinner, and he said to me, with an everlasting love, with an undying, unceasing, uncontainable love, I have loved you with. It's in Jeremiah 31, 3. You know, he gave me purpose. He gave me destiny. He made me his. Isaiah 40, uh, 43.1 says, I redeem you. I have redeemed you. I have given you a new name. You know what our new name is? He says, you are mine. That's your new name. You are mine. <laughs> That's your new name. 
You are mine. And this is who we are, you and me. We are his. Let me show you what he, what he thinks of us. You know, he, he might not, you might not see yourself this way, but this is who, we, who he says we are. In 1 Spirit 2, 9, everything is passion translation. But you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God-devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you will broadcast his glorious wonders through the world. This is who you are, who we are. And then Son of Songs 1 and verse um, 2, the Sholomite. Sholomite, just put the Sholomite, is you. It's you and me. Sholomite, we're talking Sholomite, is you and me, okay? And is the king, the king is Jesus. So, and number two says, let him smother me with kisses. His spirit kiss the vine. So kind are your caresses. I drink them in like the sweetest wine. Your presence releases a fragrance so pleasing. Over and over pour out, for your lovely name is flowing oil. No wonder the bride to be adore you. The bride to be. Who is the bride to be? We are. We are. Draw me into your heart. We will run away together into the king's cloud-filled chamber. Jerusalem maidens, in this twilight darkness, I know I am so unworthy, so in need. And the shepherd king, Jesus answers, yet you're so lovely. You're so lovely. And the Shulamite says, I feel as dark and dry as the desert tents of the wandering nomads. And Jesus answered, yet you are so lovely, like the fine linen tapestry hanging in the holy place. And the holy place, only the clean, pure, perfect, spotless person could have come in. And he says, you are like that. He wants you there. He wants you there. Shulamite says, won't you tell me, love it, of my soul, where do you feed your flock? Where do you... Where do you lead your beloved ones to rest in the heat of the day? For I wish to be wrapped all around you as I wander among the flocks of your shepherds. It is you I long for with no veil between us. No veil between us. Nothing between God and us. You know that Jesus, the last thing he did before he, he died on the cross? He was for a moment separated from God. So forever, these are the good news, that forever, forever you, it will be no separation between God and us. He suffered separation, so you will never suffer separation ever again. It is no separation between God and us. No more separation, those are the good news. No more separation between us and God. And the king says, my dearest one, let me tell you how I see you. You are so thrilling to me. To gaze upon you is like looking at one's fairest, finest horses, a strong, regal steed pulling his royal chariot. Your tender cheeks are aglow. Your earrings and jam leather necklace set them ablaze. We will enhance your beauty. Jesus wanted his, your beauty. <laughs> Imagine that. Encircle you with our golden reins of love. You see what it, what it enhance your beauty? The reins of love of God. You will be marked. You are marked with our redeeming grace. You are marked with the redeeming grace of the lover of your soul. He's lover. He's beloved. He's not just a savior that came and saved you from your sin. He's your beloved, the one that loves your soul, the one that loves and adores everything about you. This is who he says we are, his beloved, his bride, his friend, his passion. He is the lover of our souls. We are, we are the bride he wants to marry. We are the bride he wants to marry. 
You know, last, last week when Manfred preached, we were, Pastor Rick and I were pre- uh, praying and over there, and um, the Lord showed me a vision of Jesus completely uh, dressed in white and golden like a king with a crown. And he told me, I am the king that wants to marry you. I am the king that wants to marry you, all of you, all of us. We are the bride he wants to marry. We are the bride, you guys. He wants to marry. He is the king. You know, um, it's so prophetic, Megan and Harry, for me. It's so prophetic because Megan was like no royalty at all, right? She was not even an English lady. And there he comes from another another reign for another kingdom and comes and finds her and brings her in and marry her. That's Jesus. That's totally Jesus doing that with us. He came from another kingdom just to look for the bride, just to look for you to marry you. He is the king that wants to marry you. You are so worthy. He wants to marry you. After that encounter with Jesus, when he saved me, I was so in love with Jesus, my heart like exploded with love. You know, everywhere, like the passion, I cannot contain it. It's, I was, you think I am passionate right now. It's, I was like uncontainable. You know, like the like Incredibles, the little baby? <laughs> that they don't know what to do with him. You know, that like he explodes and multiplies. I was like that. I was like so uncontainable. They don't know what to do with me. <laughs> I couldn't stop myself. I loved him so much. And uh, I couldn't stop talking about the lover of my soul. I still was a bartender, and all of my regulars got safe. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't know how to preach the gospel. I didn't know what good news was. I didn't know what testimony it was. But I knew the one that loved me. I knew the one that loved me, and I couldn't stop talking about him. And I brought everybody, you need, you, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. And I would pray with them right there at the bar. Come on, get safe. <laughs> <laughs> Get safe. Come on. And uh, everybody, everywhere I, I go, you know, he was like the children. I, I wanted to be with him everywhere he was. And I desire him more than anything, more than anything, more than anyone. I desire him. My very first call was worship. When I became a Christian and started uh, doing worship, they um, asked me if I wanted to be part of the worship team. And I had no training. I never sing before. You know, as you can see, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to do harmonies or sing their professional way. But um, the, the Lord called me into, he called me. I didn't ask, he called me. So um, I will, like, I, I couldn't stop worship him. And I would get the, the cheats that they would give me, and I would close my door in my room and just put them on the, on, the, on the bed and say, Jesus, which one do you want me to sing to you? Jesus, which one do you want today? And I would spend hours and hours just him and me, just him and I, just worship him. And he will love my voice that he gave me. He will love my worship. And I will love his presence. And I will love his love for me. And I will be hours just him kissing me and me kissing him. And and nothing else matters. Nothing else mattered but to love him. My worship was not to be on the stage. My worship was not for to be seen. I would spend hours and hours, and maybe no one else knew, and I don't care who knew, because I wanted to be with Jesus and only with Jesus. You know, and many times the pastor will tell me, I became the leader, the worship leader, and I, I led worship for many years with Sophia's son, Jonathan, with my son, Rodrigo, and with my, one of my friends, Enrique. He's an amazing musician. I think he saved me of everything because I didn't know nothing about it. <laughs> but um, he made it possible for me to worship, and it was so good. But um, the pastor will tell me, you know, worship is not your calling. That's not your calling. And I would, like, my heart would break. I would, like, cry and cry. You know, I, I, you will see me crying all the time because they would tell me this. I was like, oh, I want to worship. All I want to do is worship. And then when I finally um, stepped down from worship, um, the Lord showed me that my call is worship. Because worship is not your singing on the stage. 
Worship is not just singing songs. Worship is living for Jesus. Wherever we go. You know, I would tell Jesus in my room, Jesus, here is my heart, take it. This is my heart, take it, just take it all, make it yours. Make it yours, Jesus. I will always pray that, only for him, you know? And, and that we can do in anything we do. Anything we go, anywhere we go, we can say, Jesus, here is my heart. Whatever you want to do with that, here is my life. Jesus don't want your songs. He wants your heart. Songs are not enough. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants everything about you. He wants it all. He gave it all for you. And, and many times we think, you know, to worship God is like, uh, we had to give it all and leave it all behind. That's not true. The truth is that he wants to be part of everything you are. He just don't want to be Jesus in the church. He want to be Jesus in every area of your life. That's worship, to live for Jesus. You know, I went to children's church one day, and, and, um, and, and the Lord put in my heart, Tell the kids, you know, in the Bible, no one, nobody worships sitting down. Kids, let's worship Jesus. In the Bible, nobody worships uh, sitting down. Worship is to love Jesus, to let him know how much you love him. Just to, to express however way you can how much you love him. So we can use our hands and we can use our feet. We can use our voice. We can use our body. We can use our hair, our makeup, everything. <laughs> We can worship God with everything we are. And they got it. They got up and they started worshiping and dancing and twirling and they was doing that. And <laughs> they all started worshiping Jesus. I was like, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us all be like little children that we can get, that we just need to let you know that we love you however way that looks like. We just need to let you know that we're so in love with you. That's worship, just to let him know that we so love him, you know? Um, uh, Pilar told me about, about her, her daddy. He, she says that one day they went to a wedding and she was dancing, going on and on and on, dancing. And then the next day they came to church and she was dancing, dancing, dancing. And her daddy came and told her, I love that about you. You are the same everywhere you are. That was so beautiful. And that's how we are, you know? Whatever you are, just be the same. Be the same with your daddy. Be the same with Father God. Whatever you are, Jesus doesn't stay here. He was with you. I had news for you. I don't know what you're doing, but he's right there with you. You cannot hide from him, <laughs> even if you try. He's seen everything, and he likes to be part of it, right? Jesus wants to be Jesus in all areas, not only when we come to church. He doesn't stay here when you leave. He's going with you. There is no separation. Remember that. No separation between us. We are one. And this, I want to read over you. Your life, this one the Lord gave to me for you. Your life is the most beautiful worship son to Jesus. He has given you instruments. Your mouth, your feet, your hands make a beautiful melody where your hearts make the greatest sound that moves his heart and resounds together with yours on the earth. You are the greatest melody. Let me read it over you again. Your life is the most beautiful worship song to Jesus. He has given you instruments. Your mouth, your feet, your hands make a beautiful melody where your heart makes the greatest sound that moves his heart and resounds together with yours on the earth. Your sound resounds with Jesus' sound on the earth. That's what he says about you. Oh, that's so good. What did David did? 
he was the man according to God's own heart, right? He used to tend the ship and worship God, but then the lion and the bear came, and what happened? He killed them to protect the ship. That's worship right there. He tend the, the sheep, the sheep, the father owned that. And what did he do? Protect what belongs to the father. That's worship. That's so much worship. He was sent to bring food to his brother, to, to his brothers, and, and, and he served. That's worship. Serving is worship. He went, he saw Goliath trying to kill Israel, and just as with the sheep, the Spirit of God came upon him, and what did he do? He killed Goliath. He believed, he, he obeyed, that's worship. He trusted God, that's worship. And, and he obeyed and let God move through him and kill Goliath. That's total worship. That's total worship. Worship is not just singing songs. No. By the power and the grace of the one he knew, because of the intimacy that he had with God, he knew God, trusted God with the task in front of him, for he knew he also was known by God. They had a relationship. David was known as a man after God's own heart. David worshiped God with all that he was and all that he had. They knew each other. They had intimacy with each other. That's worship. Trusting God is worship. Spending time with God is worship. And spending time with God, it is spending time alone with God that is so vital, so important. You also is reading the word. That's basic, guys normal, basic, that we should do. But spending time with God is not just that. Heidi Baker, for example, she's, she goes to scuba diving to spend time with God. Yeah. Pastor Rick goes running to spend time with God, right? I go in, to the gym and I'm hitting the, the boxing bag and I'm praying in tongues. <laughs> I'm in complete intimacy with God anywhere I go, ready for him, whatever he he wants to have fun with, you know, because it's fun. It's joyful. Yes. It is truly joyful to be, to living with Jesus, to living for Jesus. is truly joyful. We don't disconnect. I want to always be in communion with the lover of my soul. When I have problems at work, I ask the Holy Spirit. Worship is a continuous relationship and intimacy with God. Yes, it's singing songs together, definitely. Dancing in the spirit by your everyday life is also worship. When you do everything unto him, when you know his voice, when you feel his calling, calling to come away with him, when you start looking like him, walking like him, with him, all he wants is your heart. Everything else comes naturally. When you give your heart to God, the spending time, the going, the doing, all is just natural. No work but a pleasure. It becomes a desire in your heart. Like when you are in love, and you can wait to see that person, right? When you are in love with, with, your, um, with your love, <laughs> you can wait to see that person. You do everything for that person to like you. You find out everything about that person, and, and you just want that person to know that you love them so much, right? Just like that with Jesus. How much more with the one that is love? God is love. He knows love better than any one of us. He is completely love everywhere he is. Anything he does is love. All about him is love. And it's like when best friends, you know, right? They start acting the same way. Right? Oh, I start dressing the same. <laughs> Or even boyfriend and girlfriend, they start dressing with the same colors, right? We start, we start looking like Jesus when we spend the time with him. Relationship takes time. You know, the, the greatest thing that you can give is time. It's something that will never come back. And, and even if you need time, like, I'm so busy, I don't have time. What did David did? He, did, he, he was so thirsty, he was hiding, he had no food, he has no water, and the mighty men of, of David went and grabbed him water. What did he do? The thing they needed the most. He grabbed the water and unto the Lord, worship you, Lord, and pour it out to him. Time.
time is the best thing you can give God. Time with God is the best thing you can give Him. My relationship doesn't grow without time. Amen. So at the children ministry, at the healing place, we are tending the sheep, killing birds and lions, right? Worshiping God, loving those he loves, walking with Jesus. At the youth, Pastor Rick and those with him are killing Goliaths. When I go to the nations, it's because I can stop talking about the love that he has for me. I want everybody to know. And this place is too small for me. I need more people to know. I need more people to know how much Jesus loves them. I need more people to know this love that is inside of me that burns with passion. I need more people to, to be redeemed and transformed and restored by the love of Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, whatever he takes me, I'll go. By the way, Rwanda is open. You can come. <laughs> come with us. But, you know, it's like that. Everywhere we go, we can stop. It's an explosion that it cannot be contained. We are worshiping everything and everything we do. If we have a mic or if we don't have a mic, we just need to pour our, our hearts. Even our jobs, you know, we all have to do it unto God. You know, that's why they say you're supposed to be excellent as a Christian. We are all doing it out unto God. And if we do it our, all unto God, it's supposed to be the best. You know, we're supposed to be the best teachers, the best intercessors, the best accountants, the best realtors, the best whatever you are, the best. Because you have the spirit of excellence. You have the spirit of the living God inside of you. You were not born to be mediocre. You, you, you are born to be God-like, Jesus-like. And Jesus was, like, amazing. He's glorious. He has eyes of fire. He shines. He's, like, beautiful and glorious. And that's how you look like. Have you seen yourself in the mirror this morning? I invite you to see yourselves in the mirror of heaven so you can see how you really look like. You know, if you just knew who you really are, if you just knew, you know, the Incredibles is like such a prophetic picture of all of us. We are hiding in a little house so nobody finds us, but we're superheroes, <laughs> you know? We need to come out of that hiding and be all that Jesus created us to be and worship him with everything we are. You know, I had a, a vision one day. I had a vision of uh, Jesus took me to this cliff. It was like so high. I've never been in the, in the canyon over there in um, Arizona, but I imagined that it was something like that. But it, it was so high, I looked like a little ant on it. And the wind was blowing so hard, so hard that it was scary, but I was so enjoying the wind. It was like almost lifting me up, but I was like, ah, oh, so good. The breath of God. And um, the Lord told me, jump. It was so high. I was like, what? No way was that. And he's like, jump. And I was like, no, no, no. And he put his hand for me to jump on it. And I jump, and he takes his hand out. <laughs> and then I became this eagle. And I started soaring with, with God. And he was a much bigger eagle than I was. And then we, as we were flying and soaring over the earth, the Lord showed me, look at me. Just look at my, at my eyes and show me. And I knew what he was saying. He was showing me something evil on the ground. And I went down and grabbed it and destroyed it. And then whoosh, I went up again and soared with him. And, and that's intimacy. You only know what other is saying through the eyes when you have intimacy. When you know that person so much that you're just looking at his eyes, you know exactly what he's saying. We need that intimacy. I need that intimacy. I don't know about you, but I need that intimacy every single day of my life with Jesus. I need that. So let's see David, Acts 13:22. After removing him, God raised up David to be king. For God said to him, I have found in David, son of Jesse, a man who always pursues my heart and will accomplish all that I have destined him to do. Was David a perfect man? No. But the intimacy that he had with God moved the heart of the father. He was a lover, a warrior, a son, and so are you and me. You and me, 
are like David, like Jesus. Psalm 25, 6 and 7, forgive my failures. This is how David related to, to God. Forgive my failures as a young man and overlook the sins of my immaturity. Give me grace, Lord. Always look at me through your eyes of love, your forgiven eyes of mercy and compassion. When you think of me, see me as, you, as one you love and care for. How good you are to me. Psalm 26, 8, Lord, I love your home. This place of the dazzling glory, bathed in the splendor and light of your presence. We are made to live in his presence. We are made to live in his presence. Amen. He was living in the presence of God. And we are, you know, right now, his presence, just close your eyes for a second and feel it. He's here. I'm like, I'm burning because of the presence of God is here. Just feel him. Feel him right now. You know, Jesus, what did Jesus told us to do? Jesus uh, says in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus answered him, love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and, and with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is like an importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. Contained within these commandments to love, you will find all the meaning of the law and the prophets. It's all about love. Love is a vertical and horizontal, just like the cross. The cross for me is the greatest symbol of love. Jesus love the Father, and at the same time love us. He is so, God is love. God is love. John 21, 15. After they had breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me more than this? And I feel like God is saying that to us, you know? Do you burn with love more than this? At least he's saying that to me. Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my lambs, Jesus said. Do you see the correlation? David was taking care of the lambs taking care of the lambs, and then Jesus is asking for the same thing. Crazy, huh? Never saw, saw that before. Jesus repeated his question the second time, Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me? Peter answered, yes, my Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then Jesus asked again, Peter, son of John, do you have great affection for me? Peter was saddened by being asked the third time and say, my Lord, you know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. And this is not just about work. You know, the, the, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. And, and we think, oh my God, you, I had to leave everything behind. I had to do this and do that. But guess what? That's not a burden when you are in love. When you are in love, anything you have to do is just a pleasure. It's like you can't wait to do it. You can't wait to do it when you are in love. It's a, a passion, a desire, whatever it takes just to be with my love. I want to be there, whatever it takes. Feed my sheep, um, clean the bathrooms, take care of the children, do worship on Sunday, be intercessor, what, whatever it takes. Go to the nations. I just want to be with you. Where do you, where do you take your lovers, Jesus? I want to be there. I want to be wrapped around your love. Where do you go that I can go with you, Jesus? You know, and He's asking you for all because He wants to give you all. He will take care of you more than you can take care of yourself. He will give you everything and more. You cannot even think or imagine the things that he has prepared for you. More than your wildest imagination. More than you can ever dream or ask is what Jesus has prepared for you. And the reaction is just like to explode and worship. To explode and love for him. That's what worship is. To let him love you. So you can know love, and with that love, love him back. 
I asked uh, one a person from IHUB, what do I do to love Jesus more? And he was like, so simple. Just ask him to give you love to love him. Sometimes we think, oh my gosh, I had to do this and this. Just ask him, even to love God, you need God. 